Tēnā koutou katoa, ki Vice-Chancellor Professor Neil Quigley, tēnā koe, thank you for the introduction. Good evening, everybody. First, I'm going to begin by introducing a little bit in Māori, and then I will continue in English. And I'm speaking here to people in the audience, who many of you can see. Um, I'm also speaking to people on Zoom, who might not be used to Māori introductions, so that's why I'm explaining myself a little bit. Ko Auraki te maunga, ko Waimakarere te awa, no o tautahi a hau, ko Ebon ngā tangata. I grew up in Christchurch, as you've heard, and as a child in the South Island, I experienced a lot of going fishing and boating, a lot of holidays with extended family. I spent time with my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and one of the things I remember very clearly is the time I spent on the water. I loved boating, and I still do. I remember my grandfather teaching me how to tie a fish hook onto the line, and I also remember him teaching me how to drive the boat, which I might have to do as a child if he fell overboard while pulling up a cray pot. These kinds of things were ordinary things for children and our family to learn if we were involved in boating and fishing. Our gender did not matter in this regard. I would have been about eight or nine, and I remember digging, helping some adults to dig um, in the backyard, and at the end of this digging task, one of the men in my family turned to me and said, I was good at digging for a girl, I don't actually remember what I felt in relation to that comment, but I do remember what happened next. My mother said in no uncertain terms that my being a girl was not relevant to my ability to use a spade. I learnt two things in that moment. I learnt that I could be profoundly underestimated, misunderstood in relation to my gender, and we have to learn that. It's not obvious. Why should it be so? In that interaction, I also learned that it's possible to speak out about these things when we are misunderstood and misread. The opportunity for children and young people to speak out about things that matter to them is something that runs through my research. This is a theme I can see now that I look back over the past 20 years, but it wasn't a theme I set out to follow. I began principally with an interest in how we make sense of who we are, how we engage understandings about sex, gender, sexuality, and how we make sense of our bodies in that context. I also began with questions about health and well-being, questions about how psychomedical discourses produce particular understandings about us as gendered and sexual human beings. And as I read, I saw again and again examples where academic literature seemed to put forward ideas about people without necessarily consulting those people. It didn't seem to matter too much what I was reading, whether I was reading psychological literature on trans people, whether I was reading suicide research about young people, or reading self-harm research about LGBT youth, or medical literature about people with intersex variations. No matter what I read, I kept seeing examples of research literature that framed people in ways that seemed to me to be less than respectful. I kept encountering academic literature that pronounced knowledge about groups of people without robustly engaging those people, without engaging in dialogue, without listening to them, to their voices, their stories. This concern has led me into this interdisciplinary field, this space that I've depicted with three overlapping shapes here. And this is where I've spent most of my time as a researcher asking people about their experiences to find out how they make sense of gender identity, the sexed body, and sexuality, among other things. 
So today I'm going to speak about three particular research areas that sit at this intersection. All of this research, sorry. So firstly, most of my research on the topic of youth suicide was done in collaboration with Liz McDermott at Lancaster University. Over 10 years of collaboration, we listened to the way that young people spoke about the topic of suicide. We listened to their stories of their experience of feeling suicidal and also sometimes their experience of using self-harm with the view that it might stop them becoming suicidal. When we began reading the research literature together, we noticed three things that really concerned us. We noticed that the existing research literature tended to frame people in pathologizing terms if they engaged in self-harming or suicide. We also noticed that the existing research literature focused very heavily on population level data. It identified risk groups and it didn't really explore the experiences of distress that lay behind those statistics. Finally, we noticed that even though there is good evidence that LGBT youth have particularly high rates of self-harm and suicidality, existing suicide prevention strategies tended to overlook LGBT youth altogether. The research that we carried out in collaboration with colleagues and students over the years produced a body of work that's very focused on the experiences and interpretations of young people, with a view to presenting this in non-pathologising ways. Over time, we came to focus particularly on the narratives of LGBT youth, highlighting life experiences such as homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic abuse, which was happening for them at home and at school. These kinds of abuse based on <coughs> prejudice are um, things that sometimes lead to homelessness and often impact on educational outcomes. We could not see any benefit in pathologising the young people who face this kind of adversity. In fact, failing to listen to their stories reducing them to statistics and psychiatric labels seems to me certain to add to, rather than reducing, the stigma that they face. So our research contributes to a wider body of work that now advocates for the inclusion of LGBT youth in suicide prevention programs, among other things. So moving on to the second topic I'm going to talk about. I started re researching trans identities as a PhD student in the 1990s. I travelled around Aotearoa, New Zealand, interviewing trans people with a view to producing narratives of trans identity and embodiment that contrasted with the academic literature. At the time, in the academic literature, trans people were fairly um, exclusively described in relation to psychiatric diagnostic terms and rarely presented as valid subjects who could speak for themselves. Thankfully, since that time, a lot has changed and there are now numerous trans researchers and journals that publish articles where trans voices are heard. In more recent years, I've been in dialogue with a number of psychologists who specialise in working with children and young people who question the gender to which they've been assigned at birth. So that is children who are born male and then as they grow do not identify as boys or children who are born female and then as they grow do not identify as girls. Some of us working in this space have noticed that there is still a tendency to think of gender in binary terms, to assume that if a person doesn't feel comfortable in one gender, that they must simply belong to the other gender. Some of my work engages with clinical psychologists where we are trying to support a genuine openness to diverse gendered possibilities focusing particularly on healthcare settings and thinking about how this could work best for young people. So the intention is to open up space for children and young people 
and also adults, to express the gender they experience, rather than only being offered the kind of healthcare that's about fitting people into binary gender, whether or not that's how they actually feel. So the point is to promote health and well-being, to affirm people's experience of themselves, rather than fitting people into social norms. What I want to spend most time talking with you about this evening is my current research. And this relates to a third topic that I've barely mentioned yet. Before I give this topic a name, I want to tell you a story about someone who we will call Tanya. When Tanya was an infant, there were medical issues that led her to undergo surgery. It was something to do with her reproductive organs. Her parents felt intensely uncomfortable about this issue, so they didn't talk to anyone about it. The doctor did explain it to them at the time, but it was something that they'd never heard of before, and it had a pretty scary-sounding medical name. Tanya's parents didn't even talk to Tanya about this over the years as she grew. They knew that they would have to one day. But they mostly wanted her to just have a normal, happy childhood. As she grew, they realised that they wanted less and less to worry their child about something that had happened years before. They figured it was best to put, be put behind them. Tanya, however, always knew that there was something wrong with her, something her parents didn't want to talk about. She knew that she'd been in hospital when she was much younger. She knew they had done some surgery down there. And she didn't know much more than that. But she had a persistent feeling something just wasn't right. If her parents didn't want to tell her what it was, maybe they were trying to protect her from something terrible. Sometimes she wondered if she was going to die but mostly she didn't want to think about it at all. Tanya's story is shared by many people. Two persistent features of stories like this are silence and distress. Silence as in, this is not something I was told about myself. This is too shameful to speak about, and I don't even have words for this if I did want to speak about it. Silence, as in, we will never be able to speak about this as a family, even though it's touched all of us deeply. The kinds of distress that are woven through this narrative are the distress of not being told what's happening to one's own body, the distress of not being involved in healthcare decisions that have a lifelong impact, and the distress of never seeing one's own reality reflected because almost everyone who has a similar experience is keeping quiet about it. In this context, I suggest that silence leads to distress, and distress leads to silence. The topic I'm referring to is sometimes called intersex. In medical terms, it gets called disorders of sex development. Though many who engage in health care and health research say differences in sex development. In recent years, there's been a move towards the term variations in sex characteristics, but it remains the case that no matter which of these terms I use, I will inevitably alienate some of the people that I would like to be in dialogue with. I'm going to give you a whole lot more terms in the moment, and these are diagnostic terms which are probably more alienating than any of the others, but I'll put them there just for information. I'm committed to being in dialogue with health professionals who can make a real difference to people's lives health professionals who want to do the best job they can to promote health and well-being. I'm also committed to being in dialogue with people who may have a diagnosis, perhaps one of these diagnoses, who may have a variation in sex characteristics, and who may identify as intersex. There are many ways that our physical development can diverge from male and female norms, many chromosomal, hormonal, and anatomical variations. It's suggested that at least 1.7% of the population has such a variation. So it's very likely that there are more than 200 people at this university with variations, and maybe around 85,000 people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. <clears throat> 
So I want to tell you about one thread of this research that I'm carrying out with colleagues. This thread relates to the topic of talking about this topic. And it relies on our being able to listen very carefully to what young people say about their experience. I'm going to show you some quotations from our interview data. These interviews were carried out as part of the SENSE project. In this project, we're interested in how people make sense of the medical interventions carried out on children with variations in sex characteristics. The medical interventions relevant here include surgery on genital and reproductive organs. This is surgery that is often done in infancy. And it also includes hormonal treatments. The medical treatment can often happen in infancy, but also can happen throughout childhood and, and youth. This research I'm talking about here is located in Scandinavia and the UK, where we interviewed health professionals who work in specialist teams doing this kind of medical intervention. A key part of the research was carried out by Tulva Lundberg in the context of her doctoral studies. She interviewed parents and young people who had personal experience of these medical interventions. So our interviews with health professionals, parents and young people produced a large body of data, but I'm just going to focus today on the question of how young people are told about their diagnosis, their treatment, their body, any aspect of this topic. Medical specialists in leading European centres are willing to acknowledge that there are difficulties and inconsistencies in how children and young people get given information about diagnosis and treatment. Clinicians explained that this isn't consistent, there are various concerns, although disclosing information to a child or young person is seen as important. The, uh, the clarity about how to do it, when to do it, who does it, uh, is, is um, just not there. One clinician said, for instance, it's assumed that the, that the child absorbs by osmosis what has happened to them. So children can be there in the discussion, there in the clinic, they're coming repeatedly for hospital visits. But it's not clear that someone routinely sits down and explains things in an age-appropriate way. Before we go any further, I'm going to have to check in with you because this is a point where there's often some confusion between um, the topic I talked about before, which was trans identities, and the topic I'm talking about now, which is intersex variations. So the distinction here with regard to trans identities, I was talking about gender identity. I was talking about a person's sense of being a girl or a boy or non-binary, for instance. But now I'm talking about variations in sex characteristics. So I'm talking about bodily features that relate to anatomy, chromosomes, hormones. The reason I'm checking in with you about that is because I'm about to show you a piece of data where we're actually talking about puberty induction. So I'm still talking about variations in sex characteristics. This is an instance where a, a person might not be able to produce their own hormones that would, would move the body into puberty, and so there will be medical intervention to induce puberty. This is what we were discussing in this particular interview, where I asked a medical specialist about the clinical ethics, the ethical implications of this, if puberty is being induced, but actually no one in the medical team is really talking with the young person in terms they understand about what is happening. In what way are they consenting to that treatment, is what I asked. And the response was absolute agreement. I think that's a very valid point. I think we haven't addressed that yet. We discuss it with the parents, we get their consent, we don't technically get the child's consent for the treatment. So, the responsibility for talking with children about their health-related issues is left up to the guardians, usually the parents, and there's little to no support given to those adults who take on that quite tricky task. Many of the parents we interviewed said that it's not easy for them to know when and how to talk about these things with children. 
they acknowledged that this is a difficult topic between parents and children. They need some support to talk about this, or perhaps someone else to help actually do it. Some explained to us why they didn't want to talk with their children at certain points in the child's life, maybe relieving the child from stress, being concerned that this is too distressing a topic to raise at any given age. Some parents talked about being afraid to bother their child with this topic at all. One said, for instance, that he didn't want to um, raise the topic with his daughter because he said, I don't want to start putting thoughts in her head. So you can see examples here where there are opportunities for at least some children and young people to be going through medical interventions, not just in infancy, but after that as well, where no one's actually talking to them about what is happening or why. On the other hand, there are certainly parents who do an admirable job of finding opportunities, tackling difficult topics, and having these conversations with their children as they are growing. Um, I'm focusing more on the instances where this doesn't work because I'm suggesting maybe there should be some processes in place to make it work more consistently. Young people that we spoke with said, for example, I think I was 14 when I got told the full diagnosis. I asked for it when I was at the doctor's. So there's an example, someone who got to the age of 14, quite possibly parents had known about it for 14 years by then, and this young person had to proactively ask. Another person said, in an ideal world, the doctor would have asked me, would you like me to tell you, to talk to your parents, or both of you together? And I would have said, I'd like to talk to you alone. So here's a young person responding to that dilemma that parents froze to, that this is a difficult topic between parents and children. So we might think, okay, so let's get health professionals to more proactively mediate this conversation. But wait, another person says, I probably blocked quite a lot of it out. I can't really remember what they said. They just defined the term AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome. I see syndrome as quite a derogatory thing. So I have concerns about the suggestion that health professionals should be the ones to mediate this topic because health professionals will often bring in diagnostic terminology, the terms that I'm referring to as pathologising, and that clearly at least some young people find derogatory. So I'm suggesting there's room for improvement in how adults talk with children and young people about variations in sex characteristics and about the medical treatment that often accompanies those variations. Some children are involved in treatment over a period of years, starting in infancy. And if there is no consistent or reliable approach to talking with the child in age-appropriate ways about what is happening, then it's likely to mean that at least some children and young people go through medical interventions with only limited understanding about what is happening and why. It's also likely to mean that the only understanding a young person can glean is a medically-based understanding. So by the time they're old enough to make their own, legally make their own healthcare decisions, they'll most often be making those decisions in the absence of broader understandings about how people live with variations, with bodily variations of any sort, how one might experience variations in terms of uniqueness and value, rather than just experiencing it in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Even when young people are old enough to, in principle, have a say in their health care, in practice, if they've not been socialised into this process of thinking and talking about their bodies in non-medicalised ways, then I would say they're unlikely to be able to fully engage in healthcare decisions anyway, even if they are technically old enough. This raises the question, who talks with children? Who's responsible for teaching children to talk about their bodies at all? Who's responsible for socialising children and young people who have a medical diagnosis into understanding their bodies in non-medicalised ways? Let's back up a little bit here. 
let's think about what it means to talk about bodies in non-medicalised ways. When a bodily variation is framed in medical terms, people are more likely to regard that variation as a problem that needs to be fixed. They're more likely to seek a medical solution to the problem. Alternatively, framing a bodily variation in non-medical terms can lead people to find other creative ways of making sense of the difference. This is a relational, emotional process, not just a medical process. We're all involved in making sense of our bodies, making sense of who we are, making sense of how we're different from one another. I'm sure that everyone listening can think of something about your body that you regard as a little different. It might be a different that is not visible to anyone else. It might be a different that you're a little uncomfortable about. It might be a difference that other people comment on. Now suppose that any aspect of those differences that we're imagining, any aspect of those differences between us, suppose they could be framed medically, could be framed as a problem, or these differences could simply be understood, understood as part of our human uniqueness, something to be celebrated or at least appreciated. Our research involves standing outside medicine and asking, what do people experience? How do they make sense of this? What kind of effect does it have on their lives? What we see people experiencing is the effect of medicalisation. Medicalisation, this process where an aspect of our lives, an aspect of our bodies, is framed in medical terms, is constructed as a medical problem, is treated as such. Medicalisation is particularly interesting and powerful because of the way it often leaves us thinking that there is no alternative when our experience has been medicalised, it simply makes sense to think of ourselves as sick or as having a disorder, as having a syndrome. We live with these for our whole lives with this idea that this is simply what we have. When this makes sense to us, it can be extremely difficult to find some other way of making sense of our experiences. So as a social researcher, I'm interested in tackling medicalisation. When health professionals work with people who present with some kind of bodily variation, there is still work to be done then to shift the language away from medically centred and problematic assumptions and towards understandings that can help the person to interpret and experience the variation in constructive ways. This means being able, for example, to experience one's sexual anatomy as something other than the object of medical intervention. People who have variations of sex characteristics and who have been courageous enough to speak out about this now have very articulate and sophisticated ways of reframing this particular bodily experience and communicating alternative understandings using social media, international conferences, developing educational materials, a whole raft of work that has been done. Some people doing this work describe themselves as intersex advocates and it is owing to them that international human rights organisations now pay attention to the medicalisation of intersex characteristics. Various human rights organisations have spoken out in recent years against this kind of medical treatment, stating that it doesn't uphold the rights of the child, and so far as children are too young to consent to surgical and hormonal intervention when it's typical, typically carried out. Aotearoa New Zealand has come to the particular attention of the United Nations for this reason. We've been charged by the United Nations Committee for the Human Rights of the Child to change how we treat children and young people medically with variations of sex characteristics. The New Zealand government has now had more than four years to respond to the United Nations on this issue this year the um, 
the, the final report is due back, and it is far from clear that change is afoot in relation to medical interventions carried out here. So, where do we go from here? My next steps in this research will be to open opportunities for creating new understandings that make sense in this particular cultural location here. Understandings that are empowering, not pathologizing. I think there's potential here for Māori intersex voices and Māori models of health and well-being to play a key part. I hope to do research that helps develop our thinking about what it might mean to respect bodily integrity and engage children and young people in age-appropriate conversations about health care. Internationally, when researchers have asked children and young people whether they want to know about health-related issues that affect them, even if that means hearing about difficult and distressing issues, they are very clear that they do want to know. They do want to be involved at all ages. So the next step is for us to become clearer about how to involve children and young people in conversations along the way so that they can e eventually have a meaningful say in their own healthcare decisions. Often when I speak with students and public audiences about this topic of medical intervention in relation to variations of sex characteristics, people often express surprise that this kind of normalising medical intervention still happens. Even though we in Aotearoa are go currently going through a United Nations review process, the issue of elective medical intervention on non-consenting minors is not widely talked about. Perhaps this issue is thought to be a thing of the past. People aren't necessarily aware of what is still happening. How we make sense of our experiences can change lives. When I was told that, for a girl, I was good at digging, my mother immediately helped me to make sense of this, saying that being a girl had nothing to do with it. She helped me by reflecting that the comment directed at me was nonsensical. We are all involved in making sense of gender, sexuality and the sexed body. How we make sense of these things makes a very real difference in people's lives. If we make sense, for example, of homophobic abuse by thinking it's inevitable that a young person who's gay will face this, it's an inevitable part of life that must be tolerated. If we make sense of homophobic abuse in this way, this can lead to self-harm and suicide for some young people. If, however, we understand the same abuse as unacceptable, then we will change the circumstances that enable the abuse. I've invited you to think about how we make sense of bodily variations in particular variations in sex characteristics. We can choose to make sense of bodily variations as an ordinary part of human development, or as solely a medical problem. The choice we make can provide space for an affirming reality. We can provide space for people to live and flourish, rather than being medicalised and rendered silent. Ngā mihi mahana kia koutou katoa. Thank you. Mm -hmm.